John Cayley is a digital language arts practitioner and a theorist, um, influenced by his training in Chinese language and culture. He has developed a literary practice in immersive 3D audiovisual environments that blurs the line between writing and creating sensory worlds. His work as a theorist explores the intersection of programmatic computer culture and literature. He is interested in different ways to think about reading and writing as a dichotomy between practice and experience. He has two printed books of poetic work, Ink Bamboo and Image Generation. Links to his internationally recognized writing and networked and programmable media are at programmatology.shadoof.net. Welcome, John Cayley. Oh, this is the clicker. Okay. <laughs> and I can just use the arrow. Can you can you get, make it play? Because I don't know Windows. It will work. Yes. Oh, do you need notes? No. Oh, okay. But I do need it to be there. <laughs> it was there a minute ago. It's gonna be there. Sorry, I'll wait till this. <laughs> there we go. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to, to thank the organizers, the Discover team, and to uh, Kay and Michael in particular. Um, I think I really applaud your, your, your initiative in, in, in uh, organizing a conference like this. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so, I'm going to speak about uh, my own practice with trying to uh, engage with a, a course for writing as a practitioner whose language, whose medium is language in uh, an artificial spatial environment. Uh, the, this, I work, the writing 3D that's referred to here is immersive, normally known as immersive VR. So it's not head mounted. You're actually in a, uh, a space uh, a room, uh, in the, the, the one I work with is a, is a cube, an eight-foot cube. Uh, three of the walls are projected, and the floor is projected. And that's enough, if the trompe l'oeil is done well enough, to give you a very strong illusion that the images projected on those surfaces are spatially present within that room. Um, so if you think about that for a minute, what that, what is that, what that implies, uh, it's, it's, it is artificial and it is illusory. Your, your perception is being tricked into thinking that you are looking at a, at a, at a coherent, graphical graphically represented space, one that, one that looks to you like it's there, but it isn't. If you, if you if you remove the goggles that give you stereo vision, you'll see what you'll see on the walls are distorted images of that space, uh, and they'll be increasingly distorted the more you move your point of view. Your point of view is being tracked, and the images will change as you move your point of view to, in order to try and trick you into thinking that they aren't moving, that the space is coherent. I'm sorry if this sounds like a, a, little, that is a little bit difficult to follow but I'm gonna try and explain it anyway. Um, there's, there are many, there's consequences to that. We're talking about, there's a geometry, and the geometry is separate for each of the projected surfaces. If the, if the, if the projected surfaces were curved, there'd be a weird, weird geometry that was also being represented mathematically. So, so you know, think of all that, and you've got your illusory, tricky space, and then what are you going to do with that in terms of, and what are you going to do with it? The default is to do a simulation. The, the default is to simulate the graph, the, the world that we have already. Um, and then I come into it at an even later stage. That's dubious for a start, by the way, just from my point of view. If you're an artist and you want to simulate the world, okay, go ahead. But, if, but why? You know, why not make why not make an entirely new space in this in this completely artificial space? Anything could go there, right? But the default is to simulate, right? Then you ask writing. Why should writing be in this space? Where is writing in this space? 
what is writing? Oh, writing is, that's writing, isn't it? And where is it? It's on a flat surface, right? A 2D surface. And what's happening is that, and now we're getting into this stuff that I'm really interested in, and that is what language is. My current, my current, uh, my current chief interest is, when does language come to be? What is the ontology of language? So this is, we call this writing, which is a graphic representation of linguistic practice. And what we find there is a 2D surface which has lines of, of marks, of letters, and they're arranged in lines, and it's linear. So although it's a 2D surface, it's essentially linear. That was one of the things, one of Saussure's two fundamentals for language, one that it, it is linear, and second that the tokens of that linear process are arbitrary. So the language is on a 2D surface, and the only reason that we can read it is because we follow the lines, we read very quickly, or almost simultaneously, the writing 3D, and even though that isn't a word in the dictionary, we can parse it because we, can, we know where the writing ends and the three begins. And we know that 3D stands for three-dimensional, right? So a lot is going on, but then it continues, John K. So and all the rest of it, right? And then you get the URLs, which are very useful. Um, but so writing already is a normally 2D, a, a process that is represented in 2D that is fundamentally linear. And we're going to put that in three-dimensional space? Why? Why write in three-dimensional space? OK, so no particular reason. Apart from, apart from the fact that artificial virtual reality is something that exists and will not go away. In other words, you will, there, there will come a time in which you will have augmented visuality that will have depth and that will also contain graphically represented writing, right? It will happen. So given that, it's, and especially in a research uh, art and, uh, you know, a research-based pra practice context of the university, it's totally legitimate to explore what this means. But it's also very, very important that we do just the type of sort of plodding phenomenological analysis in order to try and work out what it is we're doing, rather than just go full steam ahead and just put a whole lot of words up in space and then try and figure out how to read them. Because the language is brought into being by the reading and nothing else, right? The, if, 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 you, if you are a, a, a monolingual person who does not happen to know what I think of as a graphilect of English, right, written English, then that is not language, or at least not the top line. The second line is a proper name, which might have some sense to you, because it's referring to me. But the writing, the writing of writing 3D is just not language at all, because you can't read it. OK? Now, let's do, visualize that. What a terrible transition. Um, OK, so here we have, here we have something which, I'm, which, I, which takes this a little bit further. Um, I, my, as as, as uh, Michael indicated, my main uh, idea of myself as a practitioner is a d digital language artist currently. I'd like to drop the digital and just call it language artist. That's, I'm, avoiding, I'm avoiding literature, even though I work in literary arts. Uh, I'm interested in making art out of language, but as a writer, not as art and language in the 60s. Right? I'm, not, I'm not like Jenny Holzer. I'm more like a poet who wants to be able to work in other media. And, uh, and to do that, I, you know, if you do the research, you're trying to find out when did words first start moving on the screen, right? So in other words, when did, wor when did words start animating as if they need to animate? And you find that it's film titles. And then you find particularly good film titling, and this is, for a RISD audience, this should be bread and butter. Saul Bass, 
where you have here, you see what's going on here? This is all 2D, it's all flat. But the, but the figurative elements are, are doing a number of really interesting things in relation to language. So uh, the, the most striking one is obviously anatomy of a murder, where the, the figurative elements of the corpse are providing a surface on which the language can be inscribed. So if that surface wasn't there and there wasn't the contrast with the letters, then you wouldn't be able to read that language and it wouldn't exist, right? And then also, you know, graphic designers will recognize that those aren't really figurative elements, they're rules. They're, and they, they are surfaces, it's, they're putting, you're putting type on a rule. And then you see that the figurative element in the man with the golden arm, the arm going down, that's also a rule. It's a design element designed to, um, to, make, the, to make the arrangement of the title really interesting, right? To enhance the reading experience of reading the title. So, so for me, Saul Bass was, uh, was, apart from being a revelation, was somebody who was really playing with the question of if you're going to be working in design space, 2D design space, how can you, how can you really make the, uh, how can you go beyond concrete poetry where, the, where the, the elements of language are just being colored or moving or, or, or looking heavy or something? How can, you, how can you make the language actually work together with the, with the design elements in order to, in order to um, to create a new reading experiences is how I would put it, I think. Oh dear, let's leave that alone. Because it's too long to read, shall we? Because I'm sort of, let's go straight to this. So this is, this is actual work from the immersive space that, I, or actually this is a representation of work from the immersive space that, that I, I, I'm, I'm uh, that I work in. And this is my own work, so I, I understand it uh, to an extent. And, um, and it's a piece called Lens. And I'm going to show you a movie um, which, which, will, which will sort of activate this. But you'll notice that it has a, it has a sort of consonance with the, with the sole bass. At the moment, it seems very 2D, right? But but, uh, and you also notice that the size of the letters could be read as uh, depth cue. So we, we, could, we can plausibly believe that rather than lens, the, lens, the large, the large uh, lens word in white being behind the letters, maybe it's in front and maybe it's actually a punch out, right? And so that, so that is something that you can do in these artificial immersive environments. And I have to make it run. I can do it. This is amazing. OK, so watch. The, le the lens gets bigger. Right? It becomes a reading surface. And then the whole space is white. So the surface of the letter got so big that it became the light in which everything else is existing. And then you also see that the texts behind are now. Now the, there's a little cursor there because, in fact, I can move thing, I can actually move things around. In the in the interactive version of that, you could move the you could move the the lens to a place where it allows you to read the words behind. And it's a mise en abîme. So the 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 the, the, the white lens can become bigger, and then the black lens becomes bigger, and so on and so forth. And the, and then there's a then there is content inside it because it talks, it, it uh, talks about the letter being a threshold and a threshold which allows you to go beyond it into reading, right? So, so I, put, I propose this as a way of, of using what? Uh, the, support, the support material of language, that is graphics in this case, as a way of, as a way of addressing uh, the, as, as a way of ex experimenting with different reading experiences in three dimensions. You can interrupt me at any time if you have any questions about this. But it's also, but it's also, it's not a simulation in any way. If you went in, if you experienced this 
if you experience this in immersive virtual reality, what would happen would be that the, that the words would seem to be coming at you. And at a certain point when, 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 when a, a letter was becoming so big, you would be able to put your face through them. And then, it, they would, and then the, letter, the thing that was previously a, either a letter or a punch out uh, in a graphic surface suddenly becomes the space in which you are now living, if, the, if that makes any sense. And what, what, what do I want to say about that? As a, so I, as, a, as, a, as a practitioner of language, if it's about the writing or about the reading, what does that have to do with the content, the, the paraphrasable content of the words themselves, right? And that, you know, it's a, that's an open question. Do I really want to spend my time just, you know, developing a sort of formal, a formal metaphor lens? That all, so all you get to do is read lens? Or do I, want you, do I want you to concentrate on the, on the paragraphs that you use the lens to read? And, and what's, what's at stake in doing that? No, I, don't, I don't propose to answer that. So, uh, taking it a bit further, the, the, the course I actually teach is, is sort of the question that, that, uh, that students are asked to try and answer is, uh, or uh, answer by making, is produce a reading machine for artificial virtual reality or artificial immersive virtual reality. And, and that's... Inevitably, you're working with your graphics, so there's a lot to do with just organizing the graphics. Nonetheless, you can uh, develop interesting narratives that are where the language is arranged in particular ways that allow you to read it and read it and read it more interestingly. These are stills from a piece called Glitch, where where you're presented with first you're presented with a little sort of didactic passage at the beginning in the top left. And then you're presented with a corridor of language where the words are peeling off. Um, and then the, 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 gli the big glitch is when the corridor goes skew. And, and there's, very cl there's various click-throughs and there's, there's, lots of, there's quite a lot of text. And you end up in a, in a, in a sort of a 3D space of tumbling letters. Um, the, the, so there's, 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 and this is just one of many, many projects. Because uh, luckily, in in our in our situation at Brown, we have we have a, a device that is a, available to students and fairly open, and also quite easy to use because of front-end software, which you don't have don't even have to be a programmer to be able to use. Right. So this is just these are I'm, these are somewhat random remarks. So I, I apologize for that. This is a piece that that I made as a demo to show you. Now, you, know, you notice what happens there, this famous thing. I lost my font. I had a nice, I had a nice cursive font for the this is not writing. I guess they don't have it on their system. So look, this is not a pipe, obviously, because it tells us that it's not a pipe. The language says so. But the, the, the modeling of the pipe would suggest that it really is a pipe because it's, more, you know, it's behaving like a pipe in 3D space. So it, it probably is a pipe. If you were present in the, in the cave, you'd be able to put your head in the pipe to confirm that it's a pipe because you can get your head in it. I mean, literally, it's big enough to put your head in. Um, the, but notice that the language itself that's represented in 3D space doesn't behave like the pipe, not exactly like the pipe. It's a... It's actually, it, that's language there. It's the senior puzzle pipe. You can read it. It's pretty hard to read there. And technically, in, in, the, in, the, in the conceptuality of, of uh, computer graphics, it ain't there anymore, right? It's gone because it, it doesn't have any thickness. And, and writing, graphically represented language, doesn't need to have any thickness. So long as you can read it, it exists. 
it, but it doesn't need to exist graphically. It only needs, needs to exist. Actually, in 3D graphics, you can have you can have planes that only have one side. So, why did the people who 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 made the conventions for writing in 3D space give it a second side? It doesn't need to have a second side. It should be go it should not exist there either. But as language, it still exists there because we can read that as mirror writing, and you can read it as mirror writing. So it's, it's, it's still legible, so it is language. So the point I'm making there is that the relationship between the existence of language as such and graphics is, arbit is, 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 is arbitrary depending on how it's being conventionalized in the graphic space that is being represented, which is a little bit different from the way that the, way that the graphics that represent the pipe allude to its non-existence. Because there, there is similarity and also a type of behavior and visuality that's coherent with our perceptions. So language, language the, 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 the way of saying this, if you want to get a little bit philosophical, is that language's relationship to its materiality is singular. There's very, there, there are few other cultural phenomenals, phenomena that have the same sort of relationship to, to um, to their existence uh, when we, then that language does. And then um, I guess to conclude, um, uh, I, didn't, I didn't allude to, uh, this is a question for the audience. So where, or in, in your experience, where is their language in 3D? Anyone? I would say spoken. Exactly. So in other words, speech, the spe my speech now is language in three dimensions. But it's also, it's just a linear process that, is, that I, am, I am making, I am making uh, differences in the air pressure that you can perceive, that you are able to process in a linear fashion until you're able to read it in, that, as in construe it, guess what it, guess what I'm talking about, and and thus to process in your mind. And so the uh, embodied language art we've had we've have a, we have a lot of it, and you have uh, on the left you've got uh, Shakespeare's Globe in London, uh, where where you have um, writing in 3D, and then you also have if you want the pared down version you've got Not I. Um, by Samuel Beckett, where, where you've got uh, a full theatrical experience expressed just with a, a mouth high up on, you know, so, uh, somewhere up, it would be somewhere up there, just talking. Not I, no I. So thanks.